Yeah. You should see a red button. There we go. We're yeah. now recording. So I want to say good evening. Good evening. We are moving right along. Let's let's see here. We are in, I want to say week five. Week five. Just an announcement to the group, everybody, your Midterm grades went in on Wednesday and everybody's doing well. So you can check those in Banner mm -hmm. Portal and um, those are present there. So make sure for this week, everybody, you do your discussion. Make sure you have your discussion point and there is a video reflection assignment. I see some students have already done it. Yeah. You all are on it. So you already are on it. Professor, while you're doing announcement, yes. let me ask you one quick question. Go so I'm ahead, supposed folks. to graduate at the end of this period. Yes. Is there something I need to do? I know there is, but. Uh, you did the application. Okay. Correct. Okay. I, I need to do I that. I saw that. Okay. Yes, sir. I did see the application come through in my email because I we, we just oh, have to is? like sign off on it. Okay. So I got to do that. All right. Um, I thought you did. Did no, you do not that yet. already? No. Okay, okay but okay. I need to do that. Okay, please do that. I think it was somebody else in our class. So please do that. I think I sent an email out. Um, do that as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, we just have a few uh, that will be graduating in May. Yeah, May. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so please make sure you do that like, um tomorrow if not in and um let me see if i can get in that link i'll see if i can get in that link and send it to you okay okay all right yeah it's just a graduation form okay but please that's a good question anybody if you have not done so already and you're all done you're going to be finishing up please make sure you connect with the registrar office and complete your, excuse me here, make sure you complete your graduation form. Thank you. Application, should I say, graduation application. I think we have about three or four individuals graduating mm -hmm. this May. All right, good people. I want you to please make sure that you check out the module for this week. Uh, and the reading is um, in Susan White's book. We'll soon be transitioning to Costin's <clears throat> book. And make sure you complete your assignment for this week and your discussion post by Sunday. Oh, boy, we're moving fast. Sunday is the 11th. Sunday the 11th. All right. Mr. James, can you see my PowerPoint that says um, yes. inclusion? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yes. So what we're going to do tonight, everybody, and for those students who are watching the video, I want you to go ahead and grab your book. Excuse me, the Susan, Susan White book. Susan White's book, Foundations of Christian Worship. <clears throat> you all could hold one second. All right. And Christian worship. And we're going to go to, we're actually going to walk through a couple of things before we get to pages 166 is where we started our reading for this week. But there were just a couple of things I want to talk about regarding this particular term called liturgical enculturation, liturgical enculturation. And so for tonight, Mr. James, I'm going to start on page 159. And for my students who are wa who are watching this recording, you could go ahead, you could stop this and pick up your book and go to page 159. <clears throat> I just want to highlight a few things. <clears throat> oh, yeah. If you all hold one second, there is, I'm not sure if this is an emergency or something. There's a fire truck on our street. Give me one second. Let me make uh, sure nothing's going on.
Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, just jar me when you see blinking lights out, outside of the window, and there's a uh, a fire truck right in front in front of our driveway. But uh, making sure everybody's everybody's all right over here. So I'm hoping everybody's all right on the block. All right, let's go to page 159, and I want to talk about this whole issue of Christian worship and being placed in a particular culture. And so Susan White examines like. What does the church do and how did the church evolve um, with being found in a particular culture? So <clears throat> what happened? And actually, I want to go down. You'll see the paragraph. You see the paragraph that starts with the relationship? relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you don't mind, um, Mr. James, you feel like reading that paragraph for us, please? Sure, will. I just underlined it. The relationship okay. between Christian worship and culture has always been a complex and problematic one. And underlying it are seri serious issues concerning the theology of both the church and the uh, liter is that, uh, lit liturgy, liturgy. So why should Christians worry, worship not be exactly the same everywhere? We believe after all that every Christian community is embedded with the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of unity, and also that we all worship the one God. Why then have some Christians been led to worship in different ways from others? Are some ways of worship wrong and others right? Ooh. Okay, it's let's stop right there. Isn't that interesting? Right. Let's stop right there. And Susan, right, Susan White really helps us just to contemplate, she, you know, in that passage, she's not saying that, oh, this church over here is wrong and this, this place over here is right. But she really helps us to really see that, hey, you're right. There are some churches that do something different than the other. For mm -hmm. example, you remember a couple of weeks ago as we were talking about music? Mm -hmm. And there, mm -hmm. were, there are some that some churches that don't use instruments, there's some that do. And they, you know, but they're all singing. They're all, <laughs> but they're worshiping. Like some may sing a cappella. Oh my goodness, it sounds so beautiful. And some may have a full band and orchestra and it sounds beautiful. Right. Yes. And so let's just pause right there, Mr. James. She said, are some of them right or wrong? Go ahead. No, I would say, of course, this is going to come full force to us when we get into Dr. Colston's book. And we start talking about how the slaves embraced Christianity. That's right. So it's so much different from their white slave owners. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, what a good, what a good point. Yeah. Right. Because the enslaved African, right, uh, had from Africa the sense of movement and maybe playing a drum or feeling, you know, something like that, that was still mm -hmm. worship. And the European way of worship was more subdued. Mm -hmm. Neither one of them was wrong. Neither one of them was wrong. But, but I know we're getting into Costin's book, but what yeah. happened... But what happened is the Europeans would tell the enslaved Africans, hey, what are you doing? That's wrong. That's where we get into that. People saying, oh, this is right or wrong. But isn't that something Susan White brings up a very good point? Yeah, excellent point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never really thought about that. All right, so I'm going to go down to... But let's go down quickly, to, yeah. uh, Doc, uh, even today, between different churches, even different Baptist churches, right. uh, local churches, you can find uh, some differences. For instance, if you look at uh, a big city church versus yes. a rural country church, even a within the black church, yes. you see because of the cultural differences that you have growing up in the country in the rural area. You just do and accept some things differently than uh, in city churches. Then watch this. 
is every black church going to do it the same way? No. Mm -hmm. Nope. Nope, because they may, like you said, that group may, you know, me be more vocal or another group may be a little less vocal. You know, or or just the resources you have available on how you mm -hmm. go through the, the, the worship process. Um, there you go. Resources is a big point, too. So if we don't. <clears throat> Excuse me, if we don't have the money <clears throat> to like get uh, drums or organ or something like that, that makes a difference. On what we do. Uh, just a quick, if, if I might, uh, the church I Take grew up time. in, rural, rural country church, we only yeah. met twice a month for church. See? I grew up in one of those churches, we met uh, twice a month, and we actually did communion on the fourth Sunday. That's it. So uh, there were just, and uh, I was amazed when I went to to the city and I found out folk we did communion on the first Sunday. I was all like, hey, first Sunday. what are you doing? Yeah. Right, right. And look, was it wrong on the fourth? No. Was it wrong on the first? Mm -mm. The third, second. And then I'm thinking, I'm just going gonna, gonna to get a bottle of water. And I'm thinking the reason why your church did that is because of the number of preachers. It just wasn't as many. Right, right. Yeah. Just wasn't as many. So that preacher, that preacher had to rotate. That's right. That he had two or three churches. And uh, so he would uh, rotate on what churches he would do. <laughs> yeah, had a schedule. Yes, that's very good. That's a very good point. And so when we think about that example, like, OK, if the, if this church did it over here this way, in the country and this person this church did it over here in the city they're all doing communion but maybe this church didn't have certain resources doesn't mean anybody's wrong <clears throat> excellent go to the bottom of page 159 everybody i want you to see something that's very interesting that susan white says she says and it's kind of like the last sentence okay mm -hmm. she says let me backtrack. For many theologians, the answers to these questions lie in an understanding of the nature of the Holy Spirit itself. It has been argued the spirit is not only the spirit of truth, but the spirit of, and I underline this, the right. spirit of creativity and flexibility as well. Mm. And, uh-oh. OK, and that through this spirit, Christians and Christian communities are able to respond creatively to the situations in which they find themselves. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's just pause right there. When she talks about creativity, that the spirit is a spirit of truth, but also the spirit of creativity and flexibility. Mm -hmm. And um, let's 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 discuss this here. When we say creativity and flexibility, do you think that that's always readily accepted? No. No. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it seems like folks will say, "Oh no!" Like rigid. rigid. Got to be rigid. Don't try to make it flexible. <laughs> you you could almost see that in the whole history of the church. How uh, once a, a trend or a custom gets uh -huh. in place, then it becomes sort of overriding everything else. And then when something different or new or comes in, the resistance. And uh, always, yes, yeah, we, we can see this all the way back from Jesus's time, as a matter of fact. You know, that's true. And I think when new things come in, yes, we and you know what? I'm gonna take that back. I'm gonna take that back. It's not necessarily new things, yeah, because the culture is the people that you know, we're here, God is here, 
Right. God is not changing. I think it is opening. I'm going to rephrase it to this kind of opening of the eyes. Like even when we went back and we talked about instruments, right? right. Well, the instruments were way back in the Old Testament. The instruments just didn't jump up and right. invent themselves in like the 1600s. They were already there. <laughs> They were already there, but it was just this opening of the eyes to say, oh, hey, we could use the instrument this way. And um, then somebody else to say, hey, take the organ out of here. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Mm. A couple more things I want to highlight for you on page 162. On page 162, there's a section that says local forms of liturgical enculturation. And let me just say real quick. So she talks about the enculturation in Christian worship as, as simply a way of looking at the people and saying, OK, who's here? Like you said, Mr. James, are we in a rural church? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a different culture as opposed to uh, Dr. King's church in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. That was a different group of people. All right, I am in on page 162 under the section that says local forms of liturgical enculturation. And I'm going to go to the second paragraph, okay? And I underlined this and I apologize, everybody. Go to the second paragraph and it's kind of in the middle. So you might want to highlight this. And the sentence starts with this need. This need, uh huh. Yeah, okay. This need can be expressed as a desire to feel at home in Christian worship, to find a form of worship that reflects uh, people, you know, national, tribal, or ethnic origins. Mm -hmm. So it could be music or whatever. That's what we're talking about in culturation. Like, listen, wherever we go, we want to feel welcome. We want something to speak to us to say oh yeah this is what i do mm -hmm. um to to just that and i love how let's pause right there how do you feel about, about that she said this need can be expressed as a de desire to <clears throat> feel at home in christian worship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know uh it's sometimes it's challenging enough to, if you're new to the faith. Yes. And particularly, it's challenging enough to embrace all of the concepts of, yeah. of, of, of worship, of just, just the foundations, just the, when you think about it, just the foundations of Christianity, a virgin birth, a uh, right. uh, death, a uh, resurrection, all those are so foreign to our thinking if you are new to the faith. So to embrace those contexts, it seems to me is it seems to me it'd be much more uh you're much more ready to to be able to deal with it if you're comfortable in the environment, if you're around either people or processes that you're comfortable with, or even if the music is music you're comfortable with, or the language is comfort you're comfort. It seems like it's easier to uh, deal with those the concepts than if you were in just a whole different kind of culture. Understanding. Yes. So it's the same way as if you invited someone to your house. <clears throat> right. We say, I, I say, make yourself at home. And make you yourself want, at home. Yes. <laughs> what do you want to eat? Do you want to take, take your shoes off? You could, you know, uh, because I want the person to feel that they're relaxed. Mm -hmm. I tell them, hey, this is where the restroom is. Uh, here, this is where we have the snacks. Would you like something over here? They feel at home. Mm -hmm. At home. And, and I like this. And so here's another thing, too. She says, in Christian worship, to find a form of worship that reflects their national, tribal, or ethnic origins. So we mm -hmm. go to things that we are, what's the word, familiar with. Right. 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 
if this is the the upbeat type of music that I like, then we go to something that has that music that we like, or the mm -hmm. preaching that we like, or what whatever the style is, you know. Okay, um, I promise we're getting to what's on the slide. So I do. I wanted to do a little background for you before we get into this. Go to page 163, everybody. On page 163, it says new forms of enculturation. I'm going to be in that section. Okay. On page 163, there's a section that says new forms of enculturation. And I'm going to highlight a few sentences here. Y'all just hang with me. If you have a highlighter or a pen, you may, <laughs> may just want to underline these things. Okay. All right. And I'm going to start at the paragraph that says culture is a complex. You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. It says culture is a complex and subtle thing. We are often more aware <laughs> of the culture of others than we are of our own. Right. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when we speak of enculturation of worship, we tend almost automatically to focus on the ways in which our normal worship is changed to meet the needs of those from a foreign culture. Right. Mm -hmm. But the speed with which our culture is changing means that often we worship using forms from a culture that we have moved beyond. Mm -hmm. Mr. James, does this sound familiar? For example, mm -hmm. most of us live, most of us now live in a highly urbanized technological culture mm -hmm. that has profoundly shaped our worldview, values, and attitudes. Mm -hmm. But our worship tends to rely on images from an idealized rural past. Mm -hmm. where green fields, grazing sheep, and starry skies were commonplace experiences. Should we not think about the ways in which we might enculturate our worship to the technological culture of which we are a part? Let's pause right there. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a good question, isn't it? Should we not? Right. What y'all think about Susan White's point right there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we not think about the ways in which? And I, you know, uh, let me mention one thing too. Sometimes this is forced upon us. For instance, during uh, mm -hmm. COVID, yes. COVID uh, forced us, many of I say us, some of us, yeah. uh, especially us smaller churches. It forced us to embrace some technology yes. that we didn't necessarily embrace before COVID. That's right. So sometimes the the environment, those things that change, and and the technology was there. Yes. Uh, we just didn't we just didn't think about it in the worship context, and uh, so a lot of times we are. Uh, it may be, in a sense, forced upon us in that it's supposed to do it. And I think it's a, a good point. It's something we're struggling in with my church in particular uh, is um, is uh, attracting younger people, younger adults in particular. And so we're wrestling with that a little bit because we're, we're sort of very traditional, if you would, in our worship experience and so we we're, we're trying to wrestle with how not to get too far from who we are but yet uh embrace uh what younger people some younger uh people may be uh, comfortable with that's excellent well your church not the only one ours too <laughs> a lot of them a lot of them yeah it's it's uh 
it's not impossible, but you're right. It is like, okay, wait a minute. And I think Susan White really brings up a good point. She <clears> says, <throat> should we not think about the ways in which we might enculturate our wow. worship to mm -hmm. the technological culture in which is a part. Yeah. So technology could be a part of that. It could be, you know, even we could fill in that blank. Like, should we not think about new things? Mm -hmm. um, you know. See, All right. And I, I look at them as tools that God has provided for us. I, in my mind, God allowed, or I would say um, created, but allow yes. the technology to be created. So therefore, yes. uh, we we have every right to use it uh, for his purposes. Right. It's not bad, you know. Right. We can use it for a good purpose. Of course, people right. can use stuff bad. Yes. Uh, yeah. In a bad way, you know. All right. Good job. Good job. Good discussion. Let's go to... Page 164, how are we doing here? Oh, we're doing good, okay. okay. 164, now we're getting into what we're going to chat about tonight. The language of worship, everybody there at the top? Page 164 at the top. It says the language of worship. Hmm. And I just want to highlight a couple things of what happened in the 16th century. Um, all right. It says questions. You see that part, questions? On top of page 164. Oh, yes. Questions. Okay. Of questions of the most appropriate language for Christian common prayer are certainly not new. Right. In the 16th century, those who sought a reformation of the church sought also a reformation of liturgical language in order to allow Christians to pray, sing, and proclaim their faith in God in their own language. So let me just pause. Mm -hmm. This gives us some background because sometimes people like inclusive language. What is all of this language language? Well, mm -hmm. look, way back in, 16, in the 16th century, she says that this was an issue because the people, they were often using Latin. So if we're doing all this Latin and the people don't speak Latin, how am I going to worship? We're not even speaking the language. And uh, that was a move. OK, so anyway, I'm going to go right here. The move to vernacular liturgy as the norm was finally completed with the permissive stance of the Second Vatican Council. OK, so I'm going to stop right mm -hmm. there. Let's just talk about that real quick, everybody. So when we talk about language, changing the language, do you think that was really important? Of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they found a need to say, hey, wait a minute, we're getting away from one language. And I don't think that Latin is used much right now. Yeah, you see it more so in medical, in the medical field, they kind of use it mm -hmm. for their terms, but uh, it's kind of died out now. But in terms of the Latin, the people are like, hey, I don't I want to worship. And remember what Susan White said, to feel at home. Mm -hmm. How am I going to feel at home? It's like me going to a Spanish church and they're doing Spanish and I'm like, I don't know what they're saying. Yeah, what you're saying. I want to get into it, and maybe I know a couple of the words, and I can kind of move my hand with the <laughs> with the music, but I'm gonna be lost. I'll be lost in the Spanish church. Professor, oh, uh, remember yeah. uh, one of one of the driving forces behind the uh, King James Bible was that's uh, right. King James' uh, desire to have. Uh, um, That's right. A Bible that was that the common English right, at that time, even though there That's were right. other English translations, he wanted one that would, uh, uh, I guess, they speak their their version of the uh, of, of, English. of the language, as well as some additional research that he had the scholars to do. 
Yes. So yes, King James was the first English. And so they took a while to get that together because yes, so we wanted people to read the Bible, but how I'm going to read it. And it's in Hebrew, Greek, and then you had the Latin Vulgate, um, you know, <laughs> that really kind of throws people off. Okay, I'm just looking out the window. To, and, uh, it's a fire truck out here, but we're doing all right. I don't know what's going on, but it's it seemed like it's moving away. So I guess the neighbors are okay, but it wasn't here for us. Okay. <laughs> all right, so when we talk about language, that was a really good example that Susan White sets up as we get into inclusive language because we want people to to understand. And Mr. James, you talked about the even the King James Version of the English Bible, but even since then, watch Ooh. that, there have been other English trans uh, versions, I'll put it like that, like right. New International, New Revised Standard. It's still English, but people was, look, you move in, move in, move in hundreds and hundreds of years later, the thou and the thee and the that, we don't talk like that. No, right. And so, right. And so now, I mean, not even in the 2000s, you could even go back years back. We weren't using thee and thou 50 years ago and things. So we had more translations like the Good News Bible, the NIV and things like that, that help people with the language and say, OK, I don't understand the 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 that type of language because I don't talk like that. <laughs> you know. All right. All right. So let's go here. Um uh, and I apologize I can't see everybody. Is that Miss Brenda? Yes. It is. Good evening. Good evening. Good, good to evening. You. you can hear me, huh? I sure can. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, I came in the best way I could. I see I'm not, you know, identified on here. <laughs> oh, the video. Okay, but we can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Your name. And see your name. Yeah. Um, All right. Wonderful. So we're going to, let's see here. We're moving. I want to move you through this. Um, if you don't mind, Miss Brenda, would you mind reading our uh, four bullets? Sure. Languages used in worship settings. There is a challenge to make sure it does not hurt or demean others, especially marginalized groups. In the 1980s, studies emerged on the implication of using inclusive language in worship. Examples. Inclusive language in worship setting would stir away from a sole male pronoun eliminate man or mankind and say people are humans. Mm -hmm. It is also using words and images that reflect and reinforce the full equity of women in the church and society. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. So this gives us a <laughs> this gives us a good opening into what in the world is this inclusive language that Susan White and really and Susan White, I just want to let you know Susan White is not the only one that researches this is you know you know mm -hmm. others have talked about it but i thought that this was really good how she broke it down where i want to go to the top da -da -da -da. examples include okay and remember we talked about the king james version so in king james things would be referred to as well, and not just in King James, but making mm -hmm. man or making mankind, nothing wrong with it. So, and I do just want to put a disclaimer with that. Nothing wrong with saying man. We we love our men, right? It's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing wrong with the word mankind. But when people hear it, let's say a little girl or even myself as a woman or and if the little girl is not, um, I think we were talking about this earlier, Mr. James, if the person's not well versed in Christianity, like what is what is this? And if if the verse says, you know, pour out blessings upon mankind, then the little girl might be like, well, I, am I out of the blessings? Because right. 
because I'm a girl. Mm -hmm. And that is not what the scripture means because the scripture is interpreting mankind for everybody. Mm -hmm. But the person who is not sure about what you're talking about anyway, they're thinking, oh, it's just for the black blessing is just for a man. No. Mm -hmm. So it helps the people to say, um, man, excuse me, to say humankind or uh, God has a blessing for the people. The community. Uh, community. Yeah. yeah. Us. You know, <clears throat> I use a lot of terms like us. We so to make people feel included in what you're in that scripture. Yeah. And bring bringing ladies. Oh, let, let me get to the next one. Because um, I want to talk about the ladies and pronouns. So here's another debate that's out there. And when we talk about when we talk about inclusive language, just look at that as it as a scholar. I know many people are like, oh, I don't know about this, but I want you to look at it as scholarly, not necessarily like, oh, I'm gonna go out and do it tomorrow. I just I just simply want you to understand what it is. And so there have been some debates over inclusive language well of course like what did we say earlier mr james everybody's gonna have an opinion and then the people get to clashing we saw mm -hmm. that in the church history class right mm -hmm. um okay so others believe that words like mankind brotherhood fathers um meaning ancestors you know the father of such and such they could be um they, they are sometimes not understood sometimes people could get that confused um there was also a suggestion that susan white um mentions in her book as well as other scholars when we talk about inclusive language to help people as well as women to see yes god is spirit but to to just simply Nothing wrong, and listen, y'all, nothing wrong with pronouns of he, but inclusive language simply says, let's use a wide brush. And the wide brush helps people to also see other names of God as God as Lord or God as creator, God as teacher, you know, whatever it is in, in your context. So that that nothing wrong with saying the heat, but it, it also helps the people to vary their language. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. uh, and then I put down there, you know, please note we're not, you know, the, those are not suggesting that using the male pronoun is wrong. No, no, no. Um, it's saying also, along with this, who is God also creator? Lord, you know, parent. So, for example, uh, you know, people call me Kristen, but when I come on here, you call me professor. Or when I go to church, they call me Rev. <laughs> I'm Reverend Barry there. <laughs> but I'm all the same person. Go ahead, Mr. James. But, but professor, and again, I, sometimes, and, and, and I know we don't have time to get into it, but you were talking about uh, the the image that uh, the the words, the language you put around our heads. Some uh -huh. of the, some some of the most intense conversations I've had uh, have to do with the role of women in church, and I don't know. Say more. And, and I don't know if you've ever. I'm sure you have. Um, even to the point of of women in the pulpit, yeah. uh, women on uh, deacon boards, wow. and and I'm you know I know I'm old, but even some of these conversations haven't been way back uh, out of the two thousands, where there are still people uh, who just just can't understand or see. Uh, the role or see women in the pulpit, women on deacon boards, uh, women having those prominent roles uh, in the church. And part of it is because of their misinterpretation, if you would, in the message that God's given through how man has uh, interpreted 
th those words where they're using just the, the male pronouns or the male names or the mas masculine versions of it. And uh, but I, I think I think the inclusive language goes, you know, it's deep and it, it's meaningful because it has a way of of of, of putting in people's minds limitations that I don't uh, think God meant for them. Come on now, Mr. James, you better preach. That's good. Yeah. That's oh oh, that's real good. Limitations. Yeah. Right. So it's also helping us. And I put down here at the bottom, it's just a suggestion to think wider. Right. Okay. Like or more loving. <laughs> or more loving. Yeah. You know, God of love or something like that. Let me let me say this real quick and then I'm gonna move on. For example, and I am not saying this to beat up anybody. I'm just using this as an example. Somebody in a prayer. <laughs> They may say, okay, and Father God, and Father God, and Father God, and they just repeat the same thing. Nothing wrong, because we know the Lord is listening to us, okay? The Lord's not turning off the Creator's ears, right? Mm -hmm. However, how we think about the people in the pew, and, you know, Father God, and then the next part, um, Lord, and, you know, um, or we may use even even terms from the Old Testament, uh, Yahweh or Elohim or you know what whatever. It it also is educational to the people who are listening to see God bigger. Is is that what you understand? What I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So like we are we may be parents, right? You may be grandparents. You may be an aunt. You may be an uncle. You have all these titles. You have all these titles. You're a James. You're a Brenda. I'm a Kristen. You're in some spaces. You are Mr. Smith. Mm -hmm. Right? They don't even know your first name. That's right, too. Yeah. All right. Miss Brenda, you all right there? You good? I'm fine. All right. And listen. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right. Just checking. Oh, and make sure we get you, get you here. So I want you to see just some other examples. One of the. Let me move this over here. I can't see my screen. One of the here's another example. Susan White gives us is a uh, kingdom words like kingdom or master. Um, Nothing wrong. Remember, y'all, nothing wrong with saying kingdom, nothing wrong with saying master, but it just helps us to vary our vocabulary. For the individual who is not well versed in Christianity and hearing a term like master, remember, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with the word, but what's the connotation that we as black people have? <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Yeah. That that <laughs> that word master just brings images. Um yeah, somebody beating a, right. a slave or something like that. And that's why there's so much education that needs to go on, you know, in our, our houses of worship to help people to understand that hey, no, that was not that no, that should not have happened, but I want you to see that the term master in this sense is not bad. So mm -hmm. you could say instead of kingdom, kingdom of God, remember y'all, nothing wrong with saying it, a reign of God. Here's some other examples. Uh, some may say creator or redeemer, um, sustainer, um, instead of father, son, Holy Spirit, nothing, listen, nothing wrong with father, nothing wrong with son, nothing wrong with Holy Spirit. We're, we're using those words. It just gives us other words to, okay, so the father, God, creator, son, the, the son, Jesus was a redeemer, Holy Spirit, the sanctifier. So those just give us other words to uh, to use to 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 help us see the Father, Son, and 
Holy Spirit. Yeah. And sometimes you may also hear Holy Ghost as well. All right. Let's go real quick to if you have your Bible with you, Luke 13 and 34. Sometimes in scripture, let me see if I can pull this up. But um, if you if somebody gets there, just go ahead and read it. My folks who are watching the video, you can pause this and go to Luke. Chapter 13. OK. Will be 34. 34. If you get there, go ahead and read it. Uh, it says, uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather you, gather your, your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you were not willing. Actually, I'm reading for the from the new revised standard version. Okay, good. Good. That was um, the new revised standard version. And um yeah. this one, as we see in everybody, we're in Luke 13 and 34. As the Lord God is goes up as a mother. Let's see. Uh huh. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. So, mm -hmm. using the writer is using a metaphor painting just the, the beautiful way, even animals, a female animal, should I say, a female animal, a mother animal, would gather and take care of her babies mm -hmm. i think it's just so beautiful to watch animals <laughs> especially these these um uh, if you ever watch the geese after they have their babies they are oh, so yeah. <laughs> i said they have more sense than humans they are so tender and attentive to those babies mm -hmm. That is uh oh, hold on one right here. I messed up something. Okay. Oh, we're doing real good. All right. Now, as we read in some of this background here that Susan White gives us, and it kind of gives us the background to like where we are now, she lets us know that, you know, looking at the language, looking at culture, this is not nothing new. Because I want you, when you go back to your friends or your places of worship, and if something has changed, you'll say, hey, I, oh, I kind of got the background of that. I understand. Um, she says, we must always view the words we use to worship God as provisional, something to use, right? They are also a part of our relationship with God. They're a part of our relationship with God. So if we see, okay, so if we see the creator as loving and loving of all people, you know, encompassing love, right? That will come out in our words and how we refer to God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. He says, like the early Christians, we too face the challenge of finding the right words and images and language to express our walk with God. She says Christian worship is, this is very important, is the background of our liturgical language. So the pay attention to, you know, the next worship experience that you go to. Pay attention to what they say about god is is god like this mean person or <clears throat> or is <laughs> you know up in the sky beating people up or is god portrayed through the words through the proclamation as present and loving and and not you know and just as well okay and in some in some places you'll see 
And when I say in some places, like in some places of worship, the way they talk about God is just like, oh, okay, wait a minute, you're turning me off. Yeah, especially somebody who's not familiar with the terms. So let me just pause here. I don't want to talk all night, but any questions or just comments to my head? Very good. Okay. The kingdom of God. Um, Lord. Okay. We're using Lord. Um, did I put that up there? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we're going to pause right here, but I, I hope that this session really just gave you a wider lens. We'll just say it like that, a wider lens mm -hmm. to other, other ways that we can use our words to paint the picture of who the creator God is to us. And remember, nothing wrong with the male pronouns. There is nothing wrong with it. A lot of a lot of students sometimes when they come to this chapter is like, oh my goodness. But nothing wrong with the male pronoun. It just helps us to remember who's also in the audience and say, you know what? How can I help that little girl? How can I help that young lady who may not have had a father? may not see fathers as good and right. good enough. Maybe her father beat her, but right. that's a abusive. physical, right. Mm -hmm. And then we help her see a loving parent. And then later we show her that this is how a real father should be. Loving you, not hurting you, you know. Professor, you said there's nothing wrong with the word, which I agree with. But sometimes there could be something wrong with the connotation behind mm -hmm. all that, the, the attitude, if you would, behind. So if you're, if you're using that word and you're stuck in that male dominant uh, mentality, okay. then your use of the word uh, does not convey God's love. Oh, that's good. True. And I think that's what we're trying to, I think that's what uh, everyone's trying to say, is that how you speak should actually reflect God's love. God's and love. that you need to be, if, 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 if you're going to consider yourself a disciple, then you need to be mentally aware of, of, of that what you say and that what you're saying should, and to the best of your ability, reflect right. God's love. That's good. Very good point. Yeah. Very good point. Loving of, of all people. Loving you know, of all some people. Folk, yeah, because some folks think, well, we're the only people <clears> that can get love. No, God <laughs> no. Love everybody. We don't have to beat people over there. No. Uh-uh. All right. Awesome. What a wonderful discussion we had tonight. Thank you, Thank you so much, Miss Brenda mm -hmm. and Mr. James for joining you. us. Yes. <laughs> Stop. All right.